Good morning, Highline Familia. My name is Doris Martinez, she, her, her pronouns, and serve as director of the Center for Cultural and Inclusive Excellence. Welcome to today's Unity Week program, Mass Incar Incarceration by the Numbers and a Formerly Incarcerated Student Panel. Names to Numbers. Um, today, we are going to do a land and space acknowledgement. We'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all indigenous and first peoples of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community at Highline, we recognize that we are on occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands. We thank all relations and tribes today as we hold space as a community. With each of us joining from different areas, we also invite you to reflect and think indigenous and first people of the land and which you are coming from. Thank you. And now I would like to pass on the virtual mic to the lovely Harold Brooke, who will introduce this morning's presenters. Thank you, Familia, for joining us today. Good morning, Highline. My name is Hera Brooke, and I'm one of your reference librarians. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Let's take a moment to soak in this year's theme, abolition as healing, liberating our community. Abolition to end or stop, healing to become healthy again, liberation to free or release, community to be in a group. When you read this theme, it can present itself as paradoxical, but when we reflect and think of how we exist in the world, there are many experiences of living in a world of systems that are complex and sometimes self-contradictory. We invite you to reflect listen and engage in this week of programs and connect with this theme. This is the second year that Unity Week has been virtual. We have all learned to adjust, to be in community, to care, to survive, and are finding moments to breathe. I'll introduce JJ. James Jackson is a formerly incarcerated college graduate who works as a statewide education re-entry navigator and re-entry scholars program director serving the South Puget Sound and Peninsula counties from the Evergreen State College in Washington State. His work provides outreach into prisons, work releases and community corrections offices, recruiting currently and formerly incarcerated students for Washington State's public colleges. His duties include college navigation, student support, campus and institutional education. As a student first at Highline College and then at the Evergreen State College, James held several different leadership positions. He's currently working with community partners in the Evergreen Education Coalition for Justice, involved students, students to expand Evergreen at Green Hill School for Boys, and a capacity building program to bring evergreen undergraduate opportunities to Washington State Correctional Centers. His ultimate goal is to be a learning guide of sociology in an evergreen prison education program. Welcome JJ and panelists. We are so happy you are joining us for Unity Through Diversity Week 2021. Our program will go until 1055 when we'll take a short break. Take it away, JJ. Hey, JJ, now you're muted, buddy. <laughs> the dreaded mute button. Oh, that's so funny. So uh, good morning, Highline community. It's so good to come back. I am a Highline alumni, and I have, have so many special connections. Uh, to the community up there. And um, it is just, I, it's, it's an honor to be invited to come and uh, present to you all today. And so I'm going to um, open up my PowerPoint here in the share screen and get this ready. So bear with me just for a second. Um, let's see. Right. And so are, are we looking good, uh, panelists? You know what this is supposed to look like. <laughs> yes. All right. 
And so my name is uh, James Jackson. I am a formerly incarcerated college graduate, and I currently serve as a community reentry education navigator. Um, what that means is that I help students um, who are incarcerated and students who are transitioning into um, our campus communities around the straight the state with college navigation, uh, continued supports, and I am also responsible for educating our communities around the issues that impact uh, incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people and students uh, to be more uh, specific. And so, oh, and I use he, him pronouns. Okay, so um, today I'm going to be sharing with you um, a presentation called Mass Incarceration by the Numbers, and then we will move um, into a uh, formerly incarcerated student panel. And so uh, I, I always like to open these up with some acknowledgments. And this, this land acknowledgement, I uh, Doris shared a great one for you out there at Highline, and this one is a land acknowledgement for uh, the land that Evergreen <laughs> State College sits on. So we begin our time together today by acknowledging the indigenous people of the Medicine Creek Treaty, whose land on which the college stands. We acknowledge the Squaxin people who are the traditional custodians of this land and pay respect to the elders past and present of the Squaxin Island tribe. Um, we also have a justice acknowledgement that was written by um, one of our professors at Evergreen, um, and it's just really, really, um, really powerful. So just this acknowledgement, and we want to acknowledge stolen lives, lives ended too soon by what Ruth Wilson Gilmore calls an unequal distribution of premature death. In particular, we want to pay homage to George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and countless others who have lost their lives to the bigotry that leads to ongoing personal, mob, and state violence. And we want to pay homage to the many others who have died prematurely as a consequence of these structures. We started to hear it said about five years ago as a part of the movement for Black Lives, and we may need to remind ourselves for a little while yet, when Black Lives Matter, everybody lives better. And so I always have to kind of take a moment of, a, of silence after reading those um, because I really feel them. And so, okay, this here is our language statement. <clears throat> when looking to engage with system impacted students from this marginalized population, please refrain from using stigmatizing language. Words such as offender, inmate, felon, ex-felon, and convict suggest that people are no more than their conviction. Those negative labels only serve to dehumanize, re-traumatize, and re-traumatize the students we serve. We recommend humanizing language such as incarcerated people, formerly incarcerated people, returning citizen, and justice-involved people, which centers the person, not the conviction. All right, so now we'll, we'll kind of get into the body of, of the presentation. And let me adjust something here so that my notes aren't covered. All right, an overview of mass incarceration. Um, today, we will barely scratch the surface of the numbers and how we got here. This presentation is intended to give you an overview of mass incarceration. And for those who want to dig deeper, I will leave you with some resources to do so. So we're gonna we're gonna look at the whole pie. So those are the numbers. Um, we're gonna. Uh, look at a snapshot on how we got here, some popular analysis. Um, prison education and reentry reduce recidivism and formerly incarcerated, and then we'll move into the formerly incarcerated student panel. All right, so the whole pie 2020. Let's start with the numbers, <clears throat> excuse me. Excuse me. Let's start with the numbers. According to prisonpolicy.org, <clears throat> the whole pie 2020, there are 2.3 million people incarcerated in jails, prisons, and detention centers in the United States. 
in the pie, you will notice the breakdown with the biggest slices going to state prisons and local jails. Next in order would be youth confinement um, and immigration detention. Oops, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna move some stuff around on my screen again. It's in the way. Okay, all right. So, excuse me while I get situated. All right, sorry about that. So in the pie, you will notice the breakdown with the biggest slices going to state prisons and local jails, next in order youth confinement and immigration detention. For its instance, as of 2012, the US imprisonment rate was 700 people per 100,000. It is still the highest in the world today at 655 per 100,000. While most nations with similar per are below 200 per 100,000, and many are below 100 people per 100,000. U.S. imprisonment rates for black men as of 2015 were 2,613 per 100,000. Let those numbers sink in, right? Probation and parole. According to this slice of the pie, there are 7 million people on community supervision in this country. Most people who return to prison do so not because they commit new crimes, but for technical violations of their probation or parole. In Washington state, transitioning people are released with $40 in a bus ticket. Many times, conditions of release consist of weekly mental health, drug and alcohol treatment, UA, so your analysis and probation check-in appointments. Transi transitioning people are expected to find housing and employment as part of their conditions. If they have no family support, imagine trying to keep up with those expectations. When, when they don't, they may be returned to prison or jail. They may be returned to prison or jail for violating conditions of their supervision. Right. So it's almost like a setup, because if you don't have strong family support and you're just kind of throwing out there, you go right into homelessness and everything. Um, it can be really hard to overcome those barriers. OK, oops. All right. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> All right. Numbers by the millions. People impacted are not just those who land in jails, prison, or detention centers. They are their family members and communities. Not all people with felon status end up serving time behind bars. Regardless, they are still cast with the felon label. System impacted people are those who have been to jail or prison. They are also those convicted of a felony who are not sentenced to confinement. They are also their family members, I would even broaden that definition to whole communities who are impacted by the criminal justice system. And so we know in like black and, black and brown commun communities, um, basically a lot of the men have been siphoned out of those communities, right? Which just adds to already, uh, ec adds to the economic issues that are already impacting um, these communities. And the, the, ri the most fastest ri rising number currently is women. Women are the uh, being incarcerated at a higher rate than ever and than anybody else at this moment in time. Okay, U.S. incarceration compared to other countries. The United States holds 5% of the world's population, yet we hold 25% of the world's prison population. I ask you, does this mean we are a less moral country whose citizens are prone to crime? Or would this question be better framed as a socioeconomic one? While there may be a morality question here, as you will learn, that question lies in the laps of the policy and lawmakers on both sides of the political aisle. And we'll now go in and we'll kind of contextualize some of these numbers. Black and brown bodies. With racial justice continuing to be the most important social issue of our times, 
it is a wonder that we don't hear more about mass incarceration. After all, as Michelle Alexander explains in her book, The New Jim Crow, mass incarceration is the continuation of the bondage of black bodies, the evolved form of Jim Crow segregation and the continued continuation of racial caste in the United States. And so I just want you all to kind of take a second and look at this graph um, and think about what jumps out at you. I do not want to overlook the number of white people impacted by the system because they do get caught up. While poor whites make up the greatest percent of people incarcerated in the US, the gross racial disparities are evident. Is this because black people are predisposed to criminal behavior or could something else be taking place here? The facts are that racial groups commit crimes at roughly the same rates. So why are the disparities so great, right? And so I ask these questions, not necessarily for people for you to answer or whatever, but to get this marinating, right? And for you to maybe get curious about this and to uh, you look into it to yourselves, right? And, and I will give you some some references and stuff where if you're interested, you could start that research. Digital prisons. This is probably the most scary evolution of mass incarceration that is currently happening. So in 2018, Michelle Alexander updated the preface in her book, The New Jim Crow. There she identifies the next steps in the evolution of mass incarceration in the United States as the digital prison or surveillance control. Alexander explains, and I quote, while you may be set free from jail, an expensive monitoring device likely will be shackled to your ankle. A GPS tracking device provided by a private company that may charge you around 300 per month. Even now, four corporations earn a combined 200 million in revenue for their e-monitoring services. While free, your movement may be limited, making it difficult or impossible to get a job, get or keep a job, attend school, care for your kids, or visit family members. Entire communities could become trapped in, a, in digital prisons that keep them locked out of the neighborhoods where jobs and opportunities can be found. That's pretty scary stuff, if you ask me. All right, and so, how did we get here? In her book, The New Jim Crow, Arthur Michelle Alexander argues that gains won in the civil rights movement unleashed a wave of white resentment and fear that led to a political backlash. She outlines how conservatives, starting with the Nixon administration, played into the racial fears of whites to bring them into the GOP. Due to the winds of the civil rights movement and a political correctness of colorblindness, Politicians could no longer use explicitly racist strategy. Instead, they used the rhetoric of crime when referring to black people while never mentioning race. A common understanding among whites evolved that criminal meant young black male. The racism of white folks was crucial to making mass incarceration a viable system. On the other hand, Ruth Gilmore in her book, Golden Gulag identifies the loss of U.S. manufacturing jobs as corporations looked overseas and south for cheap labor, causing unemployment rates to soar in cities with large African-American communities. Compound this with the rise of neoliberal policymaking that led to the shrinking social welfare nets, what, excuse me, that led to shrinking welfare nets, and I got a little note in here, the coal part is these same policymakers expanded corporate welfare at the same time while shrinking uh, the security nets for the people. While resources for social programs went away, more dollars were directed towards prisons and jails. To exasperate things, politicians began a propaganda campaign claiming that crime was out of control in America while promoting law and order policies when the crime rate was actually in decline. In The Punishment Imperative by Todd Clear and Natasha Frost, the authors argue that most important, the most important reasons for mass incarceration is philosophical as the country moved away from a philosophy of rehabilita rehabilitation to one of punishment. 
the political and public will became more punitive. Rather than providing second chances through educational programs, job training and substance abuse programs, the public called for a system that would incapacitate. They were prisoners, criminals who broke the law. They were unworthy of second chances. This perspective was not only about criminal prosecution, it is about political disenfranchisement. Prison gerrymandering shifted political power away from urban districts where most black communities are located to mostly white rural areas. There is a familiar theme running through all the text I have highlighted in this slide. The disproportionate impacts on black and brown communities and on poor whites as compared to middle and upper class whites, they all provide credible analysis as to how we got to the place of hosting the most complete social control system, mass incarceration the world has ever seen. Racism is a powerful tool and politicians wielded it to perfection by manufacturing a, the social and political will for a drug war that is little more than a race war primar primarily pointed at black communities, a class war pointed at all poor communities, regardless of race, and a class war pointed at all poor communities, regardless of race. That was a long sentence, sorry. <laughs> Over the last 40 years, this country went on a prison building binge like never seen before in world history. Politicians on both sides of political aisle created policies and laws that helped them to fill their new prisons. Whew. It's funny because every time like, you know, I read these notes and look at these slides and stuff, it's just impactful. It doesn't get any easier. So the war on drugs, I thought this slide, I threw this slide in because I thought it relates so much with how we got here as it highlights the political shenanigans, mass racism, and media tactics employed to gain support for mass incarceration. So I just want you all to take a second and read this slide um, because a lot of times people, academics and stuff, they will talk about uh, mass incarceration and the consequences to the communities as unintended, right? But <laughs> these things were very intentional and this is um, evidence of that. And I'm gonna check the chat in case because I don't have it up. Let's see if I'm missing anything. I think I'm okay. Yeah, it looks okay. I don't think I missed anything. And so we'll go on to the next slide here. All right, so the new cast. 40, there are 46,000 collateral consequences to a kept felony conviction. A felony conviction or the Scarlet F relegates people to perpetual second-class citizenship as Michelle Alexander puts it in her book, The New Jim Crow. She makes reasonable arguments based in the empirical evidence that the felon label is responsible for a new caste system in the United States. She highlights in her big book that while crime rates continue to drop, prison populations are stable. The main driver of this stability is recidivism. High recidivism rates can be directly attributed to barriers to the barriers erected by the felon label. Even if a person never returns to prison, they are pushed to the margins, trapped in poverty, condemned by society. For millions of formerly incarcerated system impacted people trapped on the lower rungs of society, this is their reality. And so, um, you know, this, this right here is really important to understand because um, the, the, scar, the those consequences just re continue to re relegate people to, to the barriers, right? To marginalize them. Um, and it's just really hard to um, overcome that and get back into society and get, get into a economically viable position. 
And so it leads to recidivism. Recidivism versus education. As a formerly incarcerated person myself, post-secondary education while incarcerated showed me that I was capable of learning and could be a successful student. It planted the seeds of hope that maybe I could do something different with my life. Due to circumstances, I was unable to complete a degree while incarcerated. But when I got out, I knew that I wanted to return to school and that I did. I firmly believe that it is education and the hope for a better way of life that sustained my re-entry. All of the bullet points outlined in this slide for me have proven to be true. Today, I have an education that led to a career in student affairs that provides a living wage. The best part about it is I get to support others with the shared experience of poverty, racism, and incarceration to break the chains of poverty, the shackles of racism, and the cycles of recidivism that are generational. And so, or I mean, excuse me, the cycles of recidivism and generational incarceration. When people ask me, what do I think is the best tool in reducing recidivism? My answer is always education because knowing is half of the battle, right? And the numbers, the numbers here, um, it's actually 42 to 70 some percent. And that goes by a degree attainment level. And so, um, you know, students that are getting their AAs, their chances of recidivate, recidivating are reduced to like 15%. Um, students that gain their bachelor's degree, it drops to 5%. And people who are getting master's degrees, it's not even registrable, right? So about 0% of those people return to prison. So education is a proven tool to combat um, mass incarceration. All right, so like I said, uh, I was going to leave you with some resources. Um, this presentation barely scratches the surface as to the depth of mass incarceration and its socioeconomic ramifications. I encourage you to do your own research. These resources are only the tip of the iceberg. Take a swim upstream by referencing the resources in these materials where you will find treasure, a, tre a treasure chest of information. And so um, on here, you know, the new Jim Crow, of course, Michelle Alexander has done some amazing work there. And it's a well-researched uh, uh, book with loads of references. The same with the Golden Gulag by uh, Ruth Gilmore. Ruth Gilmore is a uh, political economist. And so if you're a, a political economy geek like me, uh, you'll really enjoy that, that book. Um, the Punishment Imperative by Todd Clear and Natasha Frost, right? They, they, they also have their take on it, but it's all well-researched again. Um, Understanding Mass Incarceration by James Kilgore is probably the most straightforward text there, and it just lays everything. It's pretty amazing text, too, and it just lays everything out very straightforward and very understandable. James Kilgore um, was a formerly incarcerated person. He has uh, recently passed away. Um, Human Targets by Victor Rios, right? Uh, that is a really important book that is um, uh, addresses the uh, school to prison pipeline. Victor Rios himself was um, somebody who just barely made it out of the gangs and stuff in LA. Um, and there's a chapter in that called The Labeling Hype that talks about, you know, students as young as kindergarten start, start being labeled. Um, prisonpolicy.org. This website right here is the information is continued, continually updated. And there's just a plethora of articles, um, text in there that you can um, uh, look into. Also, you can sign up and they will send you updates, continued updates with new when new things are happening as well. Uh, Vera Institute for Justice has done a lot of great work around mass incarceration as well. And so those are those are some great resources for those of you who are interested in learning more. And so. All right. So um, next we will move into our formerly incarcerated student panel uh, names to numbers. Um, 
And so if we can here, I'm going to, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here now. And if we can go ahead and, and bring in our panelists and we could uh, move into the, the panel piece. All right. Hello, panelists. Um, welcome uh, to Unity Week at Highline. And um, if we can just start with uh, you to introduce your names and pronouns, and we can start with that, with the first question. I, I guess just introduce yourselves. Uh, and let's start with Gail. Let's start with Gail today. And if you want to just introduce yourself, your names and pronouns, and the question would be, excuse my phone here, did you begin your education during or post-incarceration? Okay. Um, hi, I'm Gail Brashear. I go by she, her pronouns. Um, so very brief to a very complicated story. I was incarcerated at 15. I did 25 years with a life sentence and due to new laws in Washington state, I was released about a year and a half ago. Um, as far as my education, the first 10 years that I was at Washington Correction Center for Women, they didn't really have any opportunities, especially those for us with a really long sentence. And so about 2010, a small group of us, some very dedicated women created a nonprofit program called Freedom Education of Puget Sound, known as FETS. And at first we started, we just had this desire for something better and something more for our lives and the culture and the institution. And we were able to get volunteers that would come in and um, professors from different places that would you know, provide classes for us. And we didn't get any accreditation for it in the beginning, but we started um, working really hard with other institutions and we were able to eventually get accreditation and build an AA program. And right before I was released, they were finally able to create a BA program there. And I just really learned that education is really what gave me a voice and helped me, um, you know, find the direction I needed. Thank you, Gail. Um... Let's go ahead and, and go with Catalina next. Hello, so my name is Carolina Landa and um, I go by she, her pronouns. And so, um, yes, my uh, education started in, uh, in incarceration. I did a environmental based program through sustainability in prisons project. Um, and um, where actually those uh, certificates transferred eventually to the Evergreen State College um, uh, for credits. And so um, I really uh, attribute that program with, you know, uh, all the success uh, that I've had in, in re-entry. That was the uh, pivotal point for me um, and set me up, so... Thank you, Catalina. And something that I forgot to say earlier is like the point of the mass incarceration presentation in this panel, right, is to get folks to begin to address, you know, you got to get educated and then begin to address any of your own um, conscious or subconscious bias for formerly incarcerated people and to understand that it's not about crime so much as it is a socioeconomic question, as I stated earlier in um, the presentation. And so I just wanted to restate that. And we'll go ahead and go with Paris next. Did you begin your education during or post incarceration? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Paris Miller. Uh, I'm formerly incarcerated, uh, just completed a 21 year sentence. Um, and I, I completed, I started my, my education in um, like my second year of being incarcerated. Um, you know, I had an epiphany that basically I needed to invest my time into something that uh, was, I would get a return on it. Um, and therefore, you know, I started education and it became my rehabilitation. Thank you, thank you Paris. And, uh, Jordan? Yeah, so I'm Jordan. Uh, I just got out not that long ago after spending about the entirety of my 20s inside. And um, basically for me, I've always been a learner, not really necessarily through school. And like prior to incarceration, I learned. I just learned a lot of stuff that didn't help me. 
and that didn't help anybody. But um, basically, during my incarceration, I took it upon myself to start self-studying and learning. And um, basically, I just would start taking the different classes and programs that were offered that I felt like would help me. And uh, so I just basically did that throughout my whole time. So, you know, all of us who are formerly incarcerated that are um, in this presentation today, we started to learn, or we started our educational pathways while, in, while incarcerated. Um, and I can speak for myself, like I said earlier, I know it gave me hope and belief that like things could be a little bit different from me, for me. And so um, one of the things that I wanted to, and I'm kind of going a little bit off script, script here. So Gail, what is it that you did that was so amazing this year as far as your internship? Yeah, so um, I've just learned through um, years before I was released, I learned the impact of legislation, right? And I know that there's a lot of people out there that want to, you know, implement change and stuff like that. But sometimes they really don't understand the way policies are actually implemented within the prison or in these different ways of trying to restructure sentencing. And so, um, you know, it's really hard because especially growing up inside a prison, you're always left with this burden of feeling like because you're a felon, especially, you know, for some of our charges that you're never going to be able to pursue these things that are so passionate to you. And so in November, I was able to apply for a very competitive internship program at the state capitol, and I did not think that I was going to get accepted. And the more I was able to follow through with some of the steps of the application and the interviews and the different things, I started recognizing like, hey, I may really have a shot against, you know, a lot of these other students that are applying that come from like Stanford and all this. And um, yeah, and so not only was I chosen out of um, a mass amount of people that applied, but I was put in with Senator Jeannie Darnell's office. And if those of you who don't know who she is, she is the leader in sentence reform and juvenile rehabilitation and human services. And she's um, the Senator in Tacoma. And so I got to work with her in her small office for four months and got to really understand the challenges of passing laws and legislation and um, what needs to really be done because um, sometimes people just don't understand what's needed and they don't understand like that we're human and that yes, we may have made mistakes, but there are so many of us that get released that give real um, impact back to our communities. And so it's definitely something that I plan on pursuing more now that session has ended. And um, yeah, it's meant a lot to me. Amazing, Gail. Thank you for sharing that and congratulations on all that you have accomplished in the short time since you've uh, gotten out and started going to school. Amazing work. Um, Catalina, what, where are you at right now? Um, and, and tell us a little bit about, also, I would like to hear about your job as well. So your, your act, what you're doing academically in, in your job. Yeah. So, um, well, I graduated with my um, undergrad from uh, the Evergreen State College, and I'm five weeks away now uh, currently from my master's in public administration. So after I did my undergrad, I, I followed into the MPA track. Um, uh, also, you know, how, how Gail said, um, uh, a lot of, I'm really interested in, in policy, right, and all of that. And so um, I have three communities that I really are my focus areas, which are, um, you know, justice impacted people, you know, whether they're incarcerated or after, like that whole realm, disabilities communities, and also some immigration. Um, and those are, for me, first and second people impact impacts, right? Um, and I, you know, I truly believe that people um, that have those impacts uh, really have the power with their voice to make the most impact, right, and change uh, systemically. Um, and so, um, and I'm currently in my role. You're on mute. Uh, currently in my role, sorry about that. I work at the um, Office of the Correction Ombuds and I'm the Early Resolution Community Relations Manager. Um, and so I, uh, we work a lot of 
systemically and also individually on cases that and complaints that um, incarcerated people are bringing to us. And we have oversight to the, the 12 prisons and work releases um, um, in the state of Washington. Amazing work, Catalina, and, and uh, congratulations on your upcoming uh, graduation with your master's in public administration. Amazing. Um, and Jordan, um, let's hear a little bit about your academic and career pathway, but I also want to hear a little bit, and I want you to share a little bit with the audience on the work that you're doing with Eric Steinhoff. Yeah, so right now I'm a full-time student at Evergreen, and um, so I'm working on two books, and I'm in two of IRIC's classes right now. One's called, uh, well, they're both under Reimagining Community Safety, and so uh, one is basically all seminar and, uh, you know, our feedback with that, and then the other is basically student-originated studies, and in doing so, uh, I'm working on two books right now. One is um, justice involved. And the other one is a philosophy consciousness studies type uh, book. And um, basically, um, yeah, I, my career pathway at this point is I feel like I've come to a place where a lot of what I've been studying and what I've been spending my time on is all kind of coalescing and, um, I feel that I look at, at the world as a whole now, rather than like me versus it, right? Which is how I think a lot of us look at it for a long, a long time. And uh, so basically my idea is like, my books are my way of, of giving back and trying to help. Um, because like I said, I don't feel like we can help ourselves without helping each other and vice versa. Jordan, uh, thank you and, and amazing work. And, and I, I appreciate you as one of our great deep thinkers. And one of, one of the things that I didn't mention here is all four of the students on the panel are evergreen students. Um, and, and I'm an evergreen and Highline alumni. Uh, and so, just thought I should throw that out there. Um, Eric Steinhoff, the, the faculty that, I'm, that I talked about with Jordan has done a lot of teaching in prisons and has been um, very, very instrumental in a lot of work that we do to educate our community around the issues of incarcerated people and uh, reentry. And so um, Paris, Paris, let's, let's, why don't you tell them about you know, some of the work that you're doing, but also tell them about your recent honor from last Saturday. Um, <clears throat> there's so much. Um, so last Saturday, I gave a keynote speech um, for Evergreen, um, The Art of Giving. And uh, it was surreal, you know, um, it was a blessing to be able to uh, talk to the donors, um, to potentially invest in others, you know, um, you know, they asked me to do it. And I was like, yes, absolutely. Because I've been a recipient of scholarships and I know what scholarships can do for others. Um, also, um, I work with JJ, um, reentry scholars. Uh, that's another honor and, and blessing um, to work alongside my mentor um, towards assisting people and giving back to my community. Um, we just uh, landed an opportunity to take Toastmasters into Green Hill, JRA, um, to help the youth develop a voice, um, to be effective speakers and be able to articulate what they feel and convey that in a, in a manner that they can get assistance. Um, again, it's surreal um, from where I come from as once an at-risk youth. So, um, to be able to invest in those lives and you know help strengthen our community from um, the youth standpoint because they are the next generation um, it's an honor thank you paris and and like congratulations on the honor and thank you for all of the work that you do and 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 one of the things that i want to say about um 
doing these types of things in the youth prisons and the adult prisons and everything. In one of the proven facts is that education actually makes um, these facilities safer, right? It breaks down the racial politics that happen um, because that's what you do in a classroom, right? You start educating yourself, you start working together, and these other things begin to crumble, right? So they actually make prison safer. And then when we talked about the recidivism rates of those that get education, it actually makes our community safer and it saves taxpayer dollars. So it's like, I think it's 10,000 a year to educate some, these are like the rough numbers, to educate somebody $47,000 a year in Washington state to incarcerate somebody. And so we'll go on into the um, next question here. And this one, let's start here with, um, we'll start with you Paris. Um, Name one barrier you have faced during your transition. Um, the I would say the greatest uh, barrier um, that I face um, in my transition is being judged by my old, you know, behaviors. Um, instead of seeing him, seeing me in light of the current behavior, you know, 15 years incarceration, uh, uh, infraction free, um, full-time school, full-time employment as an engineer, um, wanting to invest in my community in all uh, ways. Um, the concept of you're a felon and you still have time to do um, has been a barrier. Um, while I was incarcerated, you know, the policies in place that tried to keep me from education yet uh, with tenacity, which was the theme of this week's speech, uh, I've had to forge through those things and believe in myself. Um, you know, the system wasn't necessarily set up to uh, assist me in seeing myself in a better light. So um, that was my greatest, you know, uh, barrier and transition, just being judged by old behaviors. Yeah, and this, this is something where I have to throw big props out to the Highline community and the Center for Leadership and Service, where I started my um, leadership journey, right, was that community hugged me in and allowed me to operate transparently, right, didn't judge me. Maybe there was some, I don't know, I didn't see it, but um, I, I wasn't judged, and that helped me to, um, I guess, exercise that internalized convict that was in me, and the paradigm shift from that to scholar, to student, to student leader um, is critical in my journey and where I am today. And so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Catalina, um, name one barrier you have faced uh, in your time. I don't know if it necessarily has to even be in your transition, but you're a barrier as a formerly incarcerated person. Um. For me, I always like to touch base on this, um, uh, more specific to like, I think there's a, an array of challenges that can happen. Um, but for me specifically, mm -hmm. one that always stands out is housing. Um, and so I, I did a big uh, move all the way. I'm originally from Eastern Washington. And, you know, my, you know, my goal was to move here and to go to Evergreen. And so I had to move all the way across, you know, uh, Wildstone probation, which is also another um, barrier, but um, move all the way to Olympia. And I just remember that I was two weeks away. I had gotten my financial aid, scholarships, everything was set, right? But I couldn't find housing two weeks away from school starting and no housing, moving across the state with a child, right? And it was, you know, I, I didn't know what to do, um, you know, but I was willing to, I had to start school, like, it was important. And so I was willing to move into a motel, right. And just live, you know, however I could until finally, um, you know, I reached out to my network, right. And my community and, um, you know, they were able to help connect me with the landlord, but, you know, he was very hesitant, you know, and I had to explain my whole background, right. Something that happened so many years ago, that wasn't me anymore. Um, but, you know, basically I made him believe in second chances. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's always uh, a big thing that, you know, has one of the barriers, right? Even moving, I've lived in the same place for the last, you know, 
six years, but even moving to another rental, like really the only way out is to buy a house, right? Uh, you're not, you know, that's not a thing, but for renting, they're still, you know, going to always continuously pull this um, background, you know, so. Yeah, um, I, I can definitely relate to that because when I transferred from uh, mine to, to Olympia, right, I came down the spring before and started seeing what I, where I might be able to find a place. And basically I was told no everywhere, no, nobody with felon status. Um, and luckily I had through the work I'd done like Catalina was able to reach into my network and, and find a place um, that way. And so housing, um, just so you all know, is the number one barrier uh, formerly incarcerated people face in their transition. And I also wanna say that it's a barrier for a lot of people with even people without you know, uh, backgrounds. And so super important that we begin to address that issue. Um, let's go, let's go next here. Um, Jordan, do you want to, so, so we got about two minutes till, till break. And so do you want to, uh, go with a, a barrier real quick, Jordan? Yeah, just real quick. Uh, I think it's something that we can all relate to whether, you know, you're an ex incarcerated person or not, but, um, just like you find yourself in positions in life where you put up walls. So, I mean, this is a, something that we all face all the time and it's never ending, but it's like taking them down. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan. Um, looks like we, that was a quick answer. So Gail, do you want to, you want to shoot at this one real quick? Yeah, for me, it was isolation. I spent so many years programming so much and schooling and working and around positive people that I had created, you know, within that environment and releasing, coming home to a community I'd never been in to my little old parents. And then COVID hit two months later. And it was just really hard for me to not have a lot of that programming and positive support system. So learning how to rebuild that out here in a community that you don't even know anything about. Yeah, that, that definitely had to be tough. And I remember having some long conversations with you. Um, one thing I, I would like to say is like Gail, Jordan and Paris, I started working with them before they were released um, and preparing the transition into our campus community and everything. And like I said earlier, Catalina and I were actually, we started at Evergreen the same time. And so she, she, she's like uh, my classmate. <laughs> but I think I think we're going to take a five minute break right now. So, you know, if y'all need to do what you need to do um, and come back at 11 o'clock and we will we'll just we have um, two more questions and then we can open it up for Q&A for the, the last pit, bit of, of the um, panel here. Thank you. Welcome back, Highline family. We'll now resume with questions for our guest panelists. Feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen as we move along. If you have any problems, just pop into the chat and let us know. Thanks. Back to you, JJ and panelists. Thank you. Um, welcome, welcome back, everybody. And you know, just another thing that I, I really want to reinstate, um, it is less about crime in our country than it is about socioeconomic issues and control systems of control. Um, I want everybody to kind of think about the emotional labor that it takes for these students to come and share so personally, right? And the goal, right, really of this whole presentation is for the audience to really challenge any of those, like I said, conscious and unconscious biases that they may have from the conditioning they receive from the messaging that we get in our society, right? And so um, we're, we'll move back in and then we're, we'll be able to open it up for questions from the audience here in just a couple minutes. But I think this is a really important question for um, our panelists. Um, name one goal you have achieved and it does not have to be in centered in education. If it is, that's fine too, but I just wanna um, open that up for you all to be able to pick what has been a very important goal for you um, as you have transitioned back in. Oh, listen, 
I guess I should start. Let's start. Uh, let's see who didn't. Uh, Jordan, let's go with you, Jordan. Um, for me, it's always just about um, basically growing. Everything is growing and learning, and uh, I feel like when we lose sight of that, or when when that's not our priority, um, we just get stagnant and we get lost. And so for me, a, a goal that I think that I've achieved, or at least that I'm achieving, is just like the continuation of pushing myself out of my comfort zone, because I feel like that's one of the most important things we can do is put ourselves in uncomfortable situations, because that's where we grow. And that's where I feel like, um, and I'm sure you guys can relate, uh, those of you that have been in, it's like, that's the thing that made us make that time worth it. And that's what made us make prison do something for us is obviously we're in an uncomfortable position anyway, but it's like putting yourself in even a more uncomfortable position for your own benefit, like for your own self growth, you know, like a diamond doesn't turn into a diamond without the pressure, you know, and a, you know, a Phoenix doesn't rise without the fire. And so I feel like just continuing to put myself in those situations and, and not be stagnant would be, would be the goal that I, uh, at least keep keep doing. I don't know about achieved. I don't know if you can achieve that one. Nice, nice. Thank, thank you for sharing, Jordan. Um, let's let's take that question over to Gail. Yeah, I definitely relate a lot with what Jordan said. I think for me, it's um, overcoming a lot of the insecurities that I had, knowing that I was going to get released, and you know, being inside of an institution since you were a small child. And then realizing that you're going to go out into the community, I didn't know, like, would I be able to have a conversation and not feel awkward? Would I be able to go into a store and know how to pay for things or utilize the internet and a cell phone? And, um, and then having all of these strengths that I've created within myself, but not knowing what that was going to look like in you know society and so I think that for a long time it was really hard for me to put myself out there in these uncomfortable situations like Jordan was talking about but then being able to recognize like I am a strong woman and I value who I am as a person now today and there are certain things that I want to achieve and just know that regardless of what that looks like to keep pushing forward and eventually like, those insecurities are starting to die away a lot but it's um it's still a challenge you know yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Gail. Um, Paris. Um, one goal um, that's reoccurring and uh, it's, I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life um, is uh, being a, a beacon of light for people that need it. Um, you know, the earliest parts of my years were brought negative, negative uh, response towards my actions, towards my family legacy. Um, and I told myself, you know, I will never do that again. And today I'm successful in, uh, forging, uh, you know, better results through my actions. And I've gotten a ton of great feedback from my community and, uh, my approach, you know, um, being called a professor or doctor, and I don't have those credentials yet, you know, um, people, push me to a status and push me out for front and I'm not scared of it. You know, um, it's my position and I take it on. Thank you. Thank you, Paris. Um, Catalina. Um, for me, it has been um, being a mother, being present, right? Um, that's a really important role. Um, you know, I'll share uh, my child is autistic. His name is Zachariah. He's like, you know, he's, he's everything. I, you know, I started to, learn, read books. Like I wanted to be this present, you know, parent for my child. And I really attribute a lot of, you know, everything I've learned, like I've learned through a different lens, you know, through him. Right. Um, just, you know, everything that I do really is for him. And so me being able to be, you know, a stable unit for him, um, really sets, you know, everything up differently for me moving forward. Thank you, um, Catalina. And, and I just know from being your friend, um, 
you're an amazing mother and um i see your strength your tenacity right i see that in all of you right strength and tenacity and i'll share one of my goals right um so when i graduated when it came time to graduate um from highline they they threw me an option out there where i could actually get like my high school diploma right and so i was like what i can have my high school diploma and so i was like yeah i signed up to get get that and so that i don't know if that was necessarily a goal at that time but it was just really cool <laughs> so to get that um okay so we we will let's see that well gail sorry i almost forgot to um ask you uh a goal you achieved <laughs> I kind of already went through it, just like overcoming my insecurities. A oh. lot of it is getting into the state capitol and doing a lot of the work there, stuff like that. You did. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I was. I got. Uh, thought I missed you. Um, okay, we'll move into the next question. Uh, aha moment. The moment things clicked for you, right? The moment things clicked for you that maybe things could be a little different for you in life. We'll start this time. Um, let, let's start with, with Paris this time. Um, there was this moment <clears throat> that, you know, I had I signed up for a computer course um, and it's a 24 month course. And I, you know, kind of slated in six months. Um, and uh, I recognized I was a nerd. You know, I had like, like really <laughs> found my identity like in one course. And that opened up the door uh, for me to sign up for another course. And I slayed it, um, my tech design. You know, I was not just a product of my, my, my circumstances, you know. And like I said, you know, rehabilitation, my, what it looked like for me was education. Um, it wasn't policy, it wasn't correction, it wasn't any of those things. It was being lost in a book and learning some new concept. Thank you, Paris. And I just wanna remind the audience too that um, you can start throwing your questions in the Q&A um, if you haven't already. And we will go to Catalina next on the aha moment question. Yeah, uh, for me, it was uh, during incarceration and I, um, you know, I wanted to pursue something after, you know, I was gaining all these skills in there and I wanted to do something for myself after. And so I had with one of the interns in the sustainability um, in prisons project, um, the graduate student, uh, you know, I had this conversation, you know, about what if I want to go to college, like, I want to pursue education. How do I get there? What are the steps, right? And also, I was like, will you help me, right? Um, it was a moment where I really started to use my voice and ask for help, right? These are tools that I that I learned and that I didn't necessarily have before, right? And that's how I started building this network and community of people. And so that was that was my aha moment with um, with him, and it just really, you know, set me up for this planning and what I've been able to, to accomplish. Thank you, Catalina. And for those that you that don't know what Sustainability in Prisons Project is, it's actually one of Evergreen's uh, service, or yeah, service, center, service centers, um, and they have sustainability programs in all 12 state prisons. And for example, I believe Catalina, you did the butterfly program where they were working with endangered species of butter Flies. Another example is they have a turtle program, right, where the our Washington State Tom per, Pond turtles were getting these shell diseases, and they would pull them out, the vets would do uh, surgery on them, and then the incarcerated technicians in that program would take care of them until they were ready to be re-released, right? And so they have different uh, programs and all the different, they got like a frog program and these different sustainability programs. It's really cool. And um, and it also uh, tracks uh, some of those technicians on their way um, to Evergreen to, um, so they get, they get like a certificate that they can 
in our certificated learning process where they can get up to 15 evergreen credits. So um, let's go ahead and go with uh, Jordan on the, on the aha moment question, the moment things clicked for you. Uh, so me, I'd say the moment things clicked for me was when, when I stopped, um, I guess, stopped having to feel like I had to prove things and, and uh, going from a place of, of really deep darkness to a place of like all life is sacred. And um, really just, I think that's more, more than a paradigm shift, but, but I'll call it that for now. Like just that paradigm shift in and of itself, um, it's basically the opposite of, of what I was where I was uh, mentally before and emotionally and, and even, uh, you know, just living living a life where, where all you care about is yourself or you're just in fight or flight survival mode all the time um, to that shift of, of actually caring about the world and caring about the people around you and seeing that, uh, that uh, you know, not only is your own life sacred, but, but all life is sacred. Amazing. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, Gail, uh-huh. Yeah, so for me, um, so I spent the first 10 years in prison, lost and broken. I was fighting the staff all the time. I spent most of my time in segregation. And in 2007, they were actually flying me down on a private jet to segregation in Arizona because they didn't know what to do with me anymore. And I remember being on the plane and it was the two pilots and security staff and me. And they were having these conversations about green energy and taxes and elections. And I realized I had not a single clue about anything they were talking about. And I just sat there and realized like I had spent these years of my life being so consumed with my own internal issues and politics of the prison. And so when we landed and I was finally able to buy a, a Walkman, I started listening to NPR and talk radio and I became um, borderline obsessive about learning about things in the world. And it eventually shifted my perspective to where when you realize the poverty that's going on in Haiti or the crisis in the Middle East, like you, you are almost incapable of feeling sorry for yourself, no matter what your situation is here a lot of times, because there are so many bigger problems. And I think that, um, recognizing my own um, naivety around the whole world is really um, what shifted me completely as a person. Wow, that's, that's incredible. Thank you, thank you for sharing that, um, super important. And so um, I know for me, my aha moment was after I received so I was 36 years old when I got to prison, didn't even have a GED, no skill, no trade. Um, all I knew how to do was sell drugs and party at that time in my life, right? Um, broke, I was very broken and everything. Um, I had to get a GED, right, to get a better pay grade in the prison industry job. This is why I decided to get my GED, right? Um, once I got my uh, instructor, Miss Henderson uh, is her name. Um, she got my scores back, called me to the office and she's like, Mr. Jackson, your scores are really high. You should think about some of these uh, college courses. They, at the prison I was at, they had a business program with the local college and they had some electives, right? And I told Miss Henderson, I was like, Miss Henderson, I'm not here for that. I'm here to get paid and get on this weight pile, right? But Miss Henderson seen something in me that I couldn't see and kept calling me to her office until she talked me into taking uh, a couple of the electives, I took cultural anthropology and a counseling course, and they had a real, you know, uh, classroom environment. We had classrooms there and everything, and I super enjoyed it, and I found out that I was kind of smart, right, and that maybe things could be different for me, and so that was the aha moment. That said, I still had a lot of personal healing and growth to do. Um, I had disciplinary issues, kind of like what Gail was talking about, got transferred to a yard where uh, they didn't really have anything going, but it was there that I did the healing, right? That I realized if I didn't figure it out, I was going to die in prison. And so I got humble, right? I accepted responsibility for my choices and decisions, 
forgave myself, forgave others, and learned to love myself again. And that cleared the way for me to be successful because it wasn't just about the book smarts. I had to be, I guess, emotionally smart as well. And so um, those are the questions that, that we have for the panel. Do we have any questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A. Am I missing that or? Is that it? Is there any questions anybody would like to ask the panelists? Let's see, I'm looking the chat here. Okay, this is a great one. How do you each practice self-care? And we'll start with Gail. Yeah, that's hard. Um, coming home, so many responsibilities. I'm taking care of two old sick parents all the time. Um, but I think for me, self-care means like when I start feeling overwhelmed or I get too anxious, regardless of what my obligations are, whatever it is, like I need to put myself first. So if I have to step away or cancel a meeting or, you know, like just to take a minute to like remind myself, I'm finally home. This is like, I need to be so grateful for every little thing that I have an opportunity to. And sometimes I can get so lost in the everyday things of what it means to exist out here. And I lose sight of that sometimes. So for me, it's just reminding myself of how grateful I am and that there are so many people that still are struggling to get to this place of freedom. Thank you, Gail. Um, let's go with Jordan next on that. Uh, so for me, uh, for one, I got like a five-month-old German Shepherd puppy, so he gives me a lot of uh, stuff to do, and um, I feel like that in and of itself is self-care, you know, like taking care of something else, and um, that, and I would say writing, you know, I feel like writing is super um, underappreciated when it comes to like processing things and actually like transforming your life. And uh, if you think I'm wrong, write for 20 days straight, prove me wrong. Nice, Jordan, thank you. And uh, let's go with uh, uh, Catalina on self-care. Yeah, um, so for me, um, for me, it's uh, spending quality time with my family. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, on the back end of that, there was a lot of like, um, building up to these goals that I had for, you know, after, you know, release. And so there was a lot of community work and, you know, a lot of, you know, um, advocate work and all this stuff and to build, 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 right. Um, my resume to build who I am, to build the presence. And, you know, there was a time where it was just so much, I would, you know, completely book myself up. Right. And then I started to realize like if I'm giving, giving consistently, I have nothing to put back, right, to myself or to my family. And so, um, and so, you know, I learned how to say no, right? I, I said, no, I don't, I'm not going to do that meeting. Sorry, I can't show up or, you know, all of that. And then I was able to give back, right? And then really spend that intentional quality time with my family because they deserve, right, for me to be there with them as well. So, yeah. Thank you, Catalina. Super important. Um, Paris? Well, um, for me, uh, I have a different perspective on self-care. Um, and a lot of people don't agree with me, but um, what I've done for self-care is um, serve others. You know, um, I think that's the one selfish thing that I do, that when I help somebody, it's almost as though when it's done and I get the smile, I can bask in that a little bit like I'm I'm accomplishing something, you know. Um, I don't know how to say no, so I may need to talk to Carolina um, <laughs> so she can help me with that one. Um, but my family members also tell me uh, the same thing, like, you know, you're always running. Well, there's work to do. So, you know, I don't find ways to rest or anything like that. I just say, yes, let's get it done. and. Um, We'll deal with all the rest of that afterwards. So, yeah, thank you, Paris, and and you can learn to say no to me. <laughs> um, and so, uh, 
self-care for me uh, is, it's, it's really hard and I haven't been great at it of late. I am, honestly, I'm just getting back to a place where I've been feeling good um, since probably the beginning of December. It's just been um, really crazy. M mental health has taken a hit. My physical health has taken a hit and everything. Um, and so, but how I've been practicing is since the sun come out, getting out and taking walks, um, exercising. Doris, Doris would probably be surprised to hear that, you know, because when I was at Highline, I was extremely fit, extremely fit, um, weighed about 150 pounds. I now weigh closer to 190. Um, but anyway, so, you know, just getting back to some of those, those practices, um, and also unplugging, right? Like at the end of the day, unplug. I just say, okay, this is it. I'm done. You know, and some some days that's harder to do than other days, but it's super important, right? And then and then do those other things around the house um, that need to be done. Um, and so, I think just being conscious of my mental and physical health, which leads to a a healthy spirit. <laughs> um, it looks like we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Can I ask yeah. you one of them? Go for it. Um, we have, I imagine that it was hard to connect with new people when you knew that they may have preconceived notions about you based on your past. How did you all approach building trust, trusting relationships and networks to support your transition outside and overcome imposter syndrome? I'm gonna go ahead and let you all, uh, whoever wants to jump in on this one, let's popcorn it. I'll just say for me, uh, I find that just being extremely honest and truthful right in the very beginning can, for one, build trust if the person is willing to accept that. And for two, can cut through a lot of BS if they're not willing to accept it. And you know where you stand. Like you just, like for me, I just, I just tell people like, that I was in prison, what I was in for, and I'm just super transparent and honest and wherever it goes from there, that's that's up to, you know, that's up to them. For real, uh, Jordan, that's that's a great answer and that's how I operate as well. So um, let's, let's let uh, Catalina take that one and then we'll go to the next question for, for uh, Paris and Gail. Yeah. Um... You know, JJ has a saying that he stands on his story, right? Um, and I really like that. You know, I really lead with my story, you know, really. And I, you know, and that's the message, right? And I believe there's a way to educate people, right? To break down those stigmas. And um, as Jordan said as well, you do, you know, you either accept it or you don't. And, um, you know, in regards to imposter syndrome, I think, you know, yeah, and those, uh, you know, when applying to certain positions or when I'm in meetings with, with DOC, right? Somebody that used to actually, you know, in car, well, I was, you know, in their care, right? Or per se in prison. And so uh, when I have those meetings, those moments will happen when I, you know, when I really think I'm, I'm not worthy, but I have to just consistently like, yes, you are, you've worked hard. You're not that person anymore. And you, you know, you are, you are powerful and you have a voice. And so, um, you know, I just talk my way out of those, those situations when my mind wants to go there. Thank you, Catalina. Thank you. The next question. Thank you all for sharing your insights and stories. Who would each of you like to professionally collaborate with and what role model or person this is like two questions. What role model person you admire, past or present, would you want to have dinner with? Gail, you want to take that one? Yeah. So as far as collaboration, I really want to remain engaged with some of the legislators that I've gotten to know that um, it's not just political for them. Like they actually care about helping to uplift impoverished communities and sentence reform. So I want to continue that work with that. As far as who I would love to have dinner with. So there is a, um, an activist slash attorney, Brian Stevenson, and he's from down south, but he 
he really puts himself out there and makes his position very vocal on racial disparities and the history of the US and how it's translated into the way that we sentence individuals. And he single-handedly is the reason why I'm even free today because of a court case he had with a juvenile and he took it all the way up to the Supreme Court, a juvenile that had life without. And every time I hear him speak in an interview or a TED talk, he's just so passionate and cares so much about his work. And yeah, I would love to have dinner with him. Um, so there, there was another question in the chat um, and it, Paris, I don't, do you feel comfortable answering that question? It looks like it was addressed uh, to, to you. Uh, it wasn't addressed to me. I just uh, reposted it because it was in the regular chats to you. So you've seen it. Okay. Um, and, and they reposted it in the question. So okay. yeah, I'll handle it. Um, for, the, for the most part, um, I don't identify. I'm like in this gray area, you know, um, I understand uh, where those that I used to hang out with, where they lie, you know, where, what some of their struggles. Um, but I'm not comfortable in that in that arena anymore. Um, and I'm not comfortable in this new identity either, because it feels like uh, I have to prove a lot, you know, in order to be uh, validated almost. Um, I will say this though, um, although sometimes it appears as though it's easy to revert back to old behaviors, they're old behaviors and you changed them for a reason. So the concept of going back to them is not an option. So when I feel like I'm overwhelmed with circumstance or decisions or pressure from the people that are around me, I try to remind myself in that moment, you know, what am I meant to learn in this moment? You know, how do I push through this without going backwards? And most times I find myself making a better decision. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult thing transitioning from prison culture to this culture. And some of us have spent a significant amount of years living in that culture. So it almost is learned behavior that we have to unlearn when we come out here. And there was a, a thing, um, I will share a tidbit, me and Jordan used to be sellies. Um, we had to theorize about how the world would receive us. So we would talk about being transparent. And in that transparency, those that accept you will be the, those that will be along for your ride and those that don't, Will people be people that you just surpass and move on from? Thank you, Paris. Great answer. And I will say this, um, for me, it was the realization that if I return to old behaviors, right, then I would return to prison, right? One of the, and, and there's more to that, right? But I mean, that's just a quick, simple answer for that one. If I return to my old behaviors, I would end up in prison, and I also knew that I would probably spend the rest of my life in prison if I went back. And so it's been it's been easy as far as that goes. Um, I do want to thank our panelists, right? Um, I want to thank you all so much for making yourself so vulnerable as you do. I'm so proud of all of you, and I'm and I'm so um, looking forward to the future of working with you as we all move, you know, in our careers and our education and stuff. And thank you so much again for coming and sharing with the Highline community. Para? Thank you again, JJ and Yale and Carolina and Paris and Jordan. We're really, really proud of you and we're honored that you joined us today. And thank you for all that you offer our community.